Hello, hello. Hey, all right. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, my name is Dup Crossan. I am the coordinator organizer here at Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. And we are very happy to have Hope Douglas from Windover Wings tonight doing a Raptor Rehab. And for those of you who don't know who Friends of Mary Meeting Bay is, we are an environmental nonprofit uh, based in the communities around Mary Meeting Bay uh, with the sole mission of trying to preserve, protect, and improve the ecosystems of Mary Meeting Bay. And we work in all of the towns surrounding uh, the bay, and we do a pretty uh, we have a pretty diverse workload, um, even though we do remain pretty small. Um, we're very much a member-driven organization, about 350 members, and a lot of our programs continue and expand just because of volunteer input. Um, so donations and volunteer, um, is, volunteer work is super, super important to us. Um, so anyone who isn't a member, we would really love to, to have you become one tonight or in the future. And uh, just to give you an idea of some of the work that we do, um, we're one of the only bodies doing research on the bay. Um, this includes anything from biomonitoring of toxins through caged mussels. We've also done a current study, and we're actually about to start um, a study with the DMR um, tagging carp to understand that, the role that that species plays in turbidity and a, a variety of other factors here in the bay. We also are a registered land trust, and we've helped to protect over 1,300 acres of critical habitat um, directly on or around the bay. And we do this mainly through conservation easements. Um, we recently just closed on um, a really vital par parcel in Dresden, one of the most important archeological sites in the state of Maine. Um, and that is the result of years and years of fundraising and volunteer input. And, um, we're going to be continuing doing uh, protection like that into the future. And then in addition to that, we also do advocacy for the wildlife and the watersheds that are intrinsically connected to the bay. Um, last year, we uh, were instrumental in getting the St. Croix River in eastern Maine uh, reopened to alewives for the first time since 1995, um, which is a huge success for all of the Gulf of Maine and the other uh, species that depend on them. And then in addition to this, uh, we also do a significant amount of education outreach. Um, we have volunteers go into fourth grade classes, um, actually all elementary school classes, but with a focus on fourth graders. And we teach them ecological and environmental lessons. Uh, and th these all culminate with biannual events um, that we do on the shores of Mary Meeting Bay. And uh, these bring a bring about a few dozen volunteers and hundreds of fourth graders to get them with hands-on activities um, demonstrating some of the things that they learn in class. And then uh, in addition to that, we also do events like this. Uh, this is our 17th year doing speaker series. Um, we bring about a variety of people, anything from canoe building to advocacy about mining rules, uh, which is one of the last one, to wildlife rehabilitation. And uh, the only reason these can even happen is because of volunteer and donation support. Um, so there is a basket going around. If uh, you did want to dro drop a small donation in, um, that's definitely the reason these events continue to happen. Um, and if you do want to sign in while you're at it, there's a sheet there. And we're going to be raffling off some door prizes from Patagonia at the end of the evening. Um, they've been helping us with door prizes for several years. Um, so if you do want to throw in a donation um, or become a member, um, feel free to talk to me during or after the presentation. Um, and yeah, I would love to introduce Hope Douglas from Windover Wings uh, up in Dresden. And she's going to be talking uh, with her bird friends here about uh, the role of wildlife rehabilitation in uh, environmental stewardship. And this is the type of program that we really love to promote here, um, just understanding the wildlife that we have more and um, yeah, I think that's about it. So thank you guys so much for coming out. Oh, it's an honor to be here. And we wanted to dedicate this program to Nate Gray, who has helped us with um, alewives for the bald eagles. They are most appreciative. It's their favorite food. And so thank you. Thank you. We're training a new bald eagle. She's not here today, but she will be in the future doing environmental education programs. We retired Noah. Noah was a Mainer. Noah was a bald, is a bald eagle that is retired from education. He did about 500 programs with us. He had fallen from his nest in Unity. 
and fractured his skull and was blind in his left eye. But an amazing part of Noah's story, his father kept him alive. His father flew down and fed him. Usually an injured baby would bring predators to a healthy group. But he was taken, this uh, bald eagle was taken to Tufts and Tufts found that he was not releasable, couldn't see, couldn't have depth perception, would be very hard to catch a fish. So he was, Windover Wings was chosen for his permanent home. And he was a wonderful, rambunctious, spirited youngster that uh, grew into his role as ambassador. Whenever I took him to a program, he always brought the whole dynamic of the bald eagle, rambunctious, and they don't take life seriously, and in case you don't, they just have a good time. I was invited to the Warwick Crown Plaza. All of the executive directors were there, and they wanted their picture taken next to a handleable bald eagle. Not many handleable bald eagles, because they have a short attention span, and it's hard to train them. So I brought Noah into this beautiful place. It was plush carpeting, and I had Noah in his box. When I opened it up, I had complete control of him. I had the leash, and Noah came out as if it was the Preakness. You know, he just bombed out of the box and hit me on the head with his wings, and, and um, picture after picture was taken with executive directors throughout the country of nature conservancies. About three days later, phone rang at, at uh, home at Windover Wings and a lady said I saw your picture in the paper and I wondered if you would bring Noah to my classroom in Rhode Island and I said certainly so I picked up my appointment book booked a program a couple minutes later the phone rang again it was a gentleman who said I saw your picture in the paper and I wondered if if Noah could do a whole assembly and I said definitely I picked up my appointment book booked the program third phone call lady said, I saw your picture in the paper. So I picked up my appointment book, and she said, I own a company in Rhode Island, and we'd like to give you a complete makeover. <laughs> and that's Noah. So we have Skywalker tonight, who's a little more uh, docile. We have four birds. We let the host choose the birds, and I believe Ed and, and Nate maybe chose them. We have an eastern screech owl. They are in Maine, but they're not seen very often. They fly silently, and they're, they're nocturnal, so it's hard to see them. We did feathers over Freeport last year, and there was one spotted in uh, Wolf Neck area. We have uh, a bird that's considered lucky by Native Americans. It's a red-tailed hawk. So you'll all have good luck with this youngster coming out. And we have the bird that is considered by scientists to be the most intelligent of the avian species. A common raven is here. Again, not many that are handleable. And in the big golden box is the king of all birds. It's a golden eagle, Skywalker. Sky's been with us for 22 years. so. Um, we're honored to have Skye. It is breeding season, and he's with a mate. Um, and he's very protective of her, so getting him away from her for a program right now is a little dicey, so I'm in one piece. And I'm very happy to say that. It's wrangling eagles, I think. Sue Barker is here, very happy to have Sue. We are going to bring out each bird as an individual, and each has a story, just as each of you have a life story. Birds aren't able to tell you their story. They are with us permanently. In Maine now, you either are a rehabilitator or an educator, and we chose education. I've been doing this for 25 years, so um, rehab, it's very difficult to be doing an educational program and not able to feed something that is back at Windover Wings. So we focus on education and bringing birds that are unable to be released back into the wild to you. There is nothing like being seven feet away from an eastern screech owl or a golden eagle. And so we're going to start with little Tansy. We named the birds, but doesn't make them pets. We respect their wildness. Um, they are all uh, wild. We don't pet them. They are all wearing anklets, which is like a leather watch band, and to that is attached a leash. They're tied to us during a program only. 
Not one bird's going to break free and land on your head or anything fun like that. And we have a splat mat because they, are, uh, they keep their traveling boxes clean, but they don't the mat. So we always tell children that we'll clean it up right away. It's no big deal. It's the highlight of a nine-year-old boy's day, I'll tell you, when uh, Skywalker lets loose. So this is little Tansy, an eastern screech owl that's just trying to wake up. Blankie, the security uh, blanket. This is Tansy, an eastern screech owl, and as Hope said, we don't see them. They're in Maine, but we don't see them very often. Um, their camouflage is great. They sleep uh, most of the day. Um, Tansy's story began in Connecticut. Uh, a woman was driving along the road, and she happened to be a wildlife rehabilitator. Driving along, and she saw colored pile of leaves next to the road and she said hmm, okay drove on and it, it got to her and she said I've got to go check this out so she turned her car around went back and it was in fact little Tansy who had been hit by a car and the colors of the eastern screech um, are either usually rufous or um, a, a brownish color and she's unique because she has several colors. So I can see why she might have mistaken her uh, for a pile of leaves. Her um, wing was damaged. Um, she lost eyesight in one eye and was taken to Horizon Wings in Connecticut uh, where they patched her up as well as they could, but she is not releasable. And so uh, Windover Wings is her forever home. The eastern screech owls, like uh, mice, um, little snakes, they like uh, voles to eat. And probably she had uh, dived down to get something to eat and was hit by the car. Um, they live to be 10 to 12 years old. Tansy is about four at this point. We don't know exactly because she was an adult when she was brought in. Um, so we're not sure of her age, but we kind of think that's it. She's the only eastern screech that we have. We have some uh, saw wets, three of those in fact, but only one of the eastern screech, and she is very happy to see you folks tonight. Yes, she was named saw wet because, um, I'm sorry, the screech owl, because um, folks thought that she sounded like a horse whinnying, and here, here's what it sounds like. Isn't that great? It's a little eerie at night in a boy. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions that Hope could answer? Maybe I could walk with her, do you yeah, think? Sure. It is one of the smallest that we have. The sawwood is smaller. Oh really? Yeah. Sawwood is about a head smaller. They're more common in um, in other southern states, but they are in Maine. They are in Maine. We don't know of breeding sites. We haven't been fortunate enough to find out. They live in holes in trees, and sometimes people that have dead trees uh, will cut them down, not realizing that it could be a home. So, yes? How do you tell the difference between a sawwet and a screech? A sawwet doesn't have the feather tufts. Just this is a great horned owl type, um, tufted. And so owls are either tufted or non tufted. A barred owl has no feather tufts, and screech does. Other questions? Yes? Nope, they adjust to the light. They can see well in the light. She's probably just trying to wake up, but. She weighs um, a little less than an orange. <laughs> About four ounces, yes. It, it's interesting, the question was, does flash bother them? And there's nothing in nature that duplicates flash, so it doesn't bother them. Even lightning um, isn't like a flash camera, so it doesn't, it doesn't bother them. They usually smile for photographs, yes. I'm sure lightning would be. Uh, <laughs> 
No, we want her calm. We like this. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm going to get the uh, red-tailed hawk out. This is a beautiful young bird that just was is getting his red tail. Takes about two years to get them to get that rusty color red tail. This bird's name is Chaplin. Uh, he was actually in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was flying through Chaplin, Connecticut, uh, and flew right through a shooting range. Oh. Oh. center who did surgery on that wing, but the bones were too splintered to put back together. So while he can fly, he certainly can't fly the demanding flight and soaring ability of the red-tailed hawk. So he's not able to be released. His mouth is open because he's hot. He lives in an outdoor aviary with an indoor section, and he loves to be outdoors. So he is there with a brand new red tail we just received from Atlanta. Uh, and so they're getting to know each other quite well. Can you imagine? They had a cold winter in Atlanta, but we brought this bird to Maine. <laughs> it was an adjustment that we did. Red-tailed hawks are the most common hawks we have in the United States. They're the ones that you can see flying in big lazy circles yeah. in the sky. So in Oklahoma, hawk making lazy circles in the sky, that's the red-tailed oh, oh, oh. red hawk. is a magnificent, intelligent bird. If you have a chance to see pale male, video that Joanne Woodward uh, narrated. Uh, it's about the, the red-tail in uh, New York City. It's a splendid video. It's on PBS and you can rent it. It's worth it. It's funny, it's moving, it's poignant. Well done. They live in the Alaskan tundra. They live in the desert. They adjust to forests. They're just incredibly adaptable, very intelligent birds. We can see them most often by highways. They might be on a pole waiting for a car to hit a squirrel. <laughs> it's worth meals on wheels. <laughs> the work is done. So. so they are really, truly wonderful. There is a, I have a friend that's a wildlife rehabilitator that had whoops, some red-tailed hawks in care. She had two adult females that were dominant. A youngster, a young male came in that had been bumped by a car. Evidently, the car ran over the bird's tail feathers and twisted some of them off. She was facing saving this bird through the winter, uh, which was approaching, or um, for the next molt, or learning how to imp feathers. It's a Chinese term. If the follicle is good and you have molted feathers, you can use non-soluble glue and just glue the feathers in. Watching this youngster with the two adult females, because he was very young, he didn't have his red <coughs> tail yet. So these ladies just wouldn't let him eat. They were very, they, they pushed him aside until they were completely done and then they let him eat. They were very dominant over this youngster. So my friend had this imping down patch, but she only had molted tail feathers from the adults. So she very carefully, using non-water soluble glue, put the red tail feathers in um, this new youngster. And he arrived in his aviary with the other two. He suddenly looked really good. <laughs> yeah. They let him eat when he wanted to. <laughs> and so color makes a whole new man just could see color. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun story. Any questions about the red-tailed hawk? Yes. I noticed your face and his beak are all close <coughs> yeah. together. 
how does so that scar? Did you? <laughs> uh, no, his means of defense are his feet. Yeah. If it was a parrot or a raven, it would be a beak. So he would be much more likely to foot something that scared him. Mm -hmm. That's why we would always wear a glove. But he wouldn't go for that an eye. No. Huh. no. Well, he tried to attack um, smaller birds, like the screech owl? He would, uh, but their favorite food are rodents. They hang out over chicken coops because uh, grain brings mice. And that's really what they like. You know, as soon as I said he would never go for um, my eyes, I was thinking of a time I had Noah, and I had a microphone. I was speaking with the microphone, which I forgot. Um, and somebody said, you're holding him awfully close to your eye. Aren't you afraid he'll bite you? And I said, not Noah. At which point, Noah picked up the sponge cover on the mic and threw it across the room. <laughs> There we are. Yes, the sound of the red-tailed hawk. Yeah. You know, when you see commercials of bald eagles soaring the skies, very dramatic pictures, they play that nice big screech of the red tail, not thinking that people won't know. Do you want to hear a bald eagle? And that's why they do the red tail. Other questions about the red tail? Yes. I always wonder what it's saying. What it what it's saying to them because it's a real it's a real. Bird. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay. Yes. Did it come by air or by? Yes, Delta Airlines. And we waited through the. No. We don't. Uh, we waited for the most of the winter to pass. We just received this one because the airlines kindly won't put a bird in cargo uh, in cold weather. Nate. They're considered migratory, but we can see them. We see them more right now. Other questions? Yes. them to call. They can be talking to each other. They can be declaring territory. They can find out where each other is. Um, so it's communication. Sometimes they just get up there and call. Other questions? Okay. I'm going to put him back. And lifespan, they can make 30. Yeah, it's, it's that long often in, well, sometimes in captivity, less long in um, in the wild. Do you want to talk about the features of a, of a raptor? Oh, sure. Because we have the raven coming out, and that'll be. Yeah. OK. Um, characteristics, I guess I have to hold it this way. Characteristics of a raven, one of them I uh, hope is already mentioned, which is their claws, their talons are for grasping food, like the knife and fork that we use, they grab them. And the curved beak, I'll bring Zach out in just a moment. He is not a raven. He thinks he is, but he is not a raptor. And um, he, will not, he does not have, of course, the uh, curved beak. And it's for shredding. And then the last one, they're, they're eyes that do not, um, that move straight forward. You probably know that. Predators have to look forward, looking for food, the prey, eyes off to the side, um, watching out for the predators. Um, so those would be the three, the three um, characteristics. We do a lot of programs in schools, and one of the things we always cover, this is preaching to the choir, but I thought it was interesting to know how long some of these items that are tossed out of cars um, live in the environment. A soda can holder eventually falls apart and can be uh, very serious to an animal that tries to get a drink of rainwater. This lasts 200 years before it biodegrades. 
So we always talk about recycling and the importance of that. The soda can holder is there. And that is invisible if it's in the water. Little kids have seen happy feet. A penguin got stuck. And when I was doing rehab, we would have Canada yeast stuck in this. Eventually they can't swallow. So this takes 400 years to biodegrade. So the solution is to cut up each one of these circles so that we save lives. This is a container that would be great if it was shaped like this, but it isn't. It's shaped like that. Little baby skunks and squirrels get caught in it, and they can't get out, and they wander into traffic. So two things to do with this, just slit the sides or put it down and stomp on it, a little anger management, just <laughs> so it won't blow away. And it's, uh, it does save lives. This takes 450 years. And another uh, one that has just sort of come in are the cups you get with the domed, the dome top with the circles, those things you cut up. They do. Balloons don't take long to biodegrade, but if they blow into the water, turtles think they're fish or something to eat. And the, this pretty ribbon is often picked up by birds to make their nests stronger, but baby birds get tangled. So fun to have balloons at a party, just have a popping party after. I get so alarmed when I see 600 balloons go up in memory of someone because it's just deadly in the environment. So needs to be uh, popped. Squirrel or this uh, turtle is caught in fishing line. This particular fishing line I took off of a great horned owl that had come down probably for a drink. He was able to fly, but he flew to a tree and the tree became entangled. We were able to get a bucket truck and get up there and take all this fishing line off of him. That takes 600 years to biodegrade, to go back into the earth, disintegrate. 600 years, so best to cut it up, um, not leave it on the side of the riverbank. Probably the biggest culprit, culprit is uh, plastic bags, 1,000 years. Every plastic bag that's ever been made is still on the planet. So we ask children and adults, how many of you recycle? And we say, turn your hand around and pat yourself on the back. <laughs> you can tie that in a knot so it doesn't blow away. Zachariah is the common raven, nothing common about ravens. Yes? In captivity. Yeah, in captivity, less than probably about 20, if they're lucky. How about other raptors? All different. All different. Smaller the owl, the shorter the lifespan. Uh, the raven is not a raptor, but he could live to be 40. Wow. So this is Zachariah, and Sue's very daring by wearing dangling earrings, I notice. Wow. Yeah, we'll get you over here. Zachariah does a lot of christening of mats. Yeah. Oh, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. I'll take okay. this, Thanks. and I'll give you this. Okay, thank you. Zachariah, uh, our resident raven. Zach's story began in a, um, about three years ago. He was in a tree, fell out of his nest, was uh, taken over to Avian Haven in Freedom. He had broken two bones in his wing, and so he, again, is non-releasable. Uh, they are so smart, um, and they're fun. I swear they have a sense of humor. I, I, I've watched him, and he just thinks so many things are a big joke. Um, he's, uh, again, about three years old. They live um, in all kinds of environments, incredibly smart. There uh, are lots of stories about, about them. He's um, loving this. I think he's a showman. Um, Hope tells the story of a, uh, a gentleman who was sitting on a park bench, and he was eating saltines, was munching away, and he saw this raven watching him from a tree branch. So he thought, I'll have a little fun with this. So he put a saltine down on the back of the bench and sat quietly and waited. And the raven came down, picked up the saltine, and flew away. 
boy, well, they're supposed to be pretty smart. Let's see what happens if I do two. So he put two saltines down on the back of the park bench, waited. Sure enough, the raven came down and took two of them. And he did this with three, and he still came down and ate them. Then he put four down, took them in his beak, flew away. And he said, oh my gosh, put down a fifth one. And the raven came down, couldn't get it. He just couldn't get it in his beak. So he took four, flew away, and came back for the other one. So they're, they're, they're great. The stories are endless. They can uh, fly upside down uh, right out on Route 1. Someone was driving along. A raven was in front of them. And again, just having a wonderful time, flew upside down for about a mile. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know that until I heard that story. Um, but there are a lot of them. I, I have to, you have to tell me, Hope, when to stop, because I will go on with that. <laughs> yes, up in uh, Canada, the ravens, again, are plentiful. And what they do is there's a, there's a grocery store in the town where people go in and out. And the ravens collect there, probably for the trash out back or uh, for any number of reasons. But they sit on top of the, on the roof where the door is, and they watch the people go in. And then when the people come out, they don't do it when they're walking into the store, but when they're walking out, the ravens line up on the roof and start kicking snow down on top of the people with their groceries. So they really do have um, a personality, and they're very, very intelligent. Ah, yes. The, the, the ravens are larger. Sometimes are, they are around here. Generally, we see crows. They are more solitary than the crows. And do we have the call? Sometimes folks say, well, what's the difference between a call? And it's hard to tell, but I think this shows it pretty well. The raptors, um, their defense is their feet, but I have to be very wary of his beak. Um, the first time I held him was at, a, we were doing an adult ed program over in Bath, and uh, he was watching me, and I had on some silver earrings, and he just started to get closer <laughs> and closer. I thought, isn't this nice? <laughs> and Hope said, no, Sue, <laughs> don't trust him. <laughs> hold him out at arm's length. But he's, he's great. I really enjoy Zach. Yeah, they, they do have the ability to speak. Uh, I have a, had a raven, Loki, in, uh, in Connecticut that had an aviary right next to the house. And, and one day there was a knock on the log cabin door. And I, I came down from the second floor and opened up the door, and nobody was there. And so I went back upstairs. And the knock came again, and this time the, the person said, Hope, Hope. And so I came downstairs, and I looked around, and there wasn't anybody there. And then I saw Loki, and I said, oh. So I went back upstairs, and third knock. Knock on the door, Hope, Hope. So I came down the stairs, and I said, cut that out. And this lady standing in the doorway said, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to bother you. <laughs> They are really amazing. Yes, question. Worried about in terms of predators. We see you can see crows and ravens mobbing uh, predators like a great horned owl. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a book out called Gifts of the Crow, and it talks about the raven's ability, same family corvid, to har harass a great horned owl, and they actually pick up sticks and poke them. They, they know that there's teamwork, there's strength in numbers, and they can drive out the serial killer from the neighborhood. And so a raven, um, a group of crows, can have a red-tailed hawk go away or an owl go away, even though the owl is capable of killing with his talons. 
Yes. Great question. That's another difference between the two. The crows have babies, and they say, stay with us. We'll make this extended. We'll have a wonderful family. It may be a huge unit. And the, the, the crows have this really big group, social group. The ravens say, 18, off you go. They, you know, when you're on your own, you're on your own. And so they'll, they'll be wonderfully loving parents. And then at, at a year, the babies go. And they form their own little flock. That's when you can see ravens together. They're yearlings. So they, they have a, a relationship with wolves because they can't open up wolf hide, um, but a wolf, I mean a, a deer hide, but a wolf can. There's a, there's a true story about a raven that had found a dead deer, uh, and he was having his own banquet um, with this dead deer. A group of crows were coming. He could hear them coming, and he knew he was about to lose his, his luxurious meal. So as they approached, he flopped over and laid on his back, pretended he was dead. And crows flying over saw a dead deer, dead raven, poison. And they flew on as soon as they were out of sight. He flopped back and started eating. <laughs> very, very, very bright. Stories could go on. Yes. up a good meal. Yes? Exactly. Yes, it's rich with culture. And yeah, when I was in Alaska picking up a bald eagle for uh, education, um, the Inuits consider this the inherited soul, so ravens are protected, souls of the departed. Uh, so they're very plentiful. If you've been to Alaska, it's a wonderful place uh, to go. And, and rich in history, the folklore goes on and on and on. They were instrumental in the bubonic plague. Um, yes? Well, they do such a great job with, with imitating. There's a raven in um, Southern Connecticut University that imitates a car alarm. Now, how annoying is that? But he we have a little brook that babbles uh, in the back of our property, and he imitates that perfectly. It's, it's just an incredible ability. Yes? They tend to be bigger. Uh, Alaskan bald eagles are, are bigger, too, so they tend to be bigger. It's probably warm. Is, they're amazing. Yeah. They're amazing. Any other questions? What do you call a group of ravens? I think it, it's a murder of crows and a. Yeah. Is it a killing of ravens? It's something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Nate? You can put them back. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they stay together. Just, I was just going to say that story yes. you mentioned Scandinavia. Yes, the ice fisherman that had cut a hole in the, in the ice uh, and he'd bait the fish and, and then uh, go away and get warm. And he came back and all the, the bait, the hook was on the, the ice and there's no fish. And he didn't know what was happening until he decided one day he had lost enough. One day he was going to hide and see what was taking his fish. So he hid found that a raven was watching him bait the line and then uh, drop the line in. And, and as soon as the man disappeared, the raven would go down. Now you have a, an ice hole. 
and you want to pick up a line and you have no hands. So they know that they can pick it up with their beak and step on it and pick it up with their beak and step on it. They catch a fish, eat the fish, and they're happy. So a little bit to clean up here, Sue, that I didn't get to. Any other questions before we move on to the golden? Yes. Smaller birds going after the bigger raptors. Yes. I actually watched a couple of ospreys beating up on a bald eagle yeah. last year, and I don't think the eagle went home that year. Oh. It was pretty, pretty nasty. Yeah. They were pretty out of them. Wow. Usually it's the other way around. It's the bald that steals the fish from the osprey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I have a story also. I was walking this, this route that I walk, and I'm very tuned into crows. I really like crows. Only because I don't see a lot of ravens. But I, and, I, and I was hearing these crows make a racket. And I have learned that when they're making a racket, something is going That's on. Right. So I started looking around. And they were actually harassing an eagle sitting in a tree. Yeah. And, um, and the eagle just kind of lifted off and flew off, not in a big hurry. And the, and the crows kind of you know, were after them and making noise and stuff. And I contacted. Um, the people at Thorn Craig's Bird Sanctuary mm -hmm. and um, said, you know, is this something that we need, we need to be concerned about? And, and he said, the crows were just having some fun. That's all they were doing. They did what they wanted to. They drove them all yeah. away. Yeah. And so that's their goal. need special permits. The reason for that is that people used to kill birds for feathers. Remember the feather plumes and the feather pens? And finally, the people of the United States approached the government and said, will you protect these birds? We're losing them. And so the government enacted the Migratory Species Protection Act, and they protect the birds. So we have to take all molted feathers and send them in uh, at the end of the year. The eagle feathers are sent to um, Colorado for distribution for Native American for accomplishments. So it's a, it's a heavy fine to have feathers, even blue jay feathers. And you walk down, you know, as Hope would know, you walk into school even with a dead stuffed animal, it's like a vacuum cleaner sucking the kids out of the classroom. They just <laughs> so miss that kind of contact. Mm -hmm. I hated burying it. It was, just seemed wrong. It was so beautiful. Yeah. Well, let's talk about eagles, golden eagles. Golden eagles are found all throughout the world. Yes. No. No. They don't. A, a bald eagle would, would take a, a raven out. Um, golden eagles are uh, amazing. This is Skywalker that's going to come out. He's 22 years old. He is from Nebraska. I understand that we have a pair, a biologist told me we have a pair of goldens in Katahdin. Yes? There was a pair in a few years ago. Yes, I heard that. And also, last weekend, I think there was a golden that was migrating through uh, um, Scarborough. Oh, there you are, at the landfill. They are uh, confused often with an immature, we'll take questions in a minute. Um, they're, they're confused often with an immature bald because they're brown. And people see an immature bald and think that it's a, it's a uh, golden. Skywalker was flying the skies way up high when somebody picked up a gun and shot him right out of the sky. He landed hard. And if you have ever had a serious medical diagnosis or lost a loved one, you know what it feels like to be shot right out of the sky. But every time I get angry at somebody that would take out an eagle, I think about all of the people that have come into this bird's life with health and kindness because somebody rescued him. It was a gentleman that had training, he had a heavy blanket, gloves, 
He was able to safely get this eagle to a veterinarian. She cared greatly for this golden eagle, but to save his life, she had to amputate his right wing. Loss of flight, freedom, balance, and heat forever. And this was 22 years ago. Nowadays, that would be an automatic euthanasia, but back then, the government ad allowed a wing amputation of a raptor. He, it's euthanasia now because balance is such a serious problem, and they fall often, and it, it, they do lose heat. Um, I originally fought that regulation with the government, but I do understand how serious it is for a one-winged raptor. It, it's a serious disadvantage. So this bird was sent to a rehabilitation center in Nebraska. Going through intensive care and rehabilitation, he became angry. He didn't want to be touched anymore. He didn't want any more medical treatments. He didn't want anybody to approach him. And he was just angry. He was getting dangerous, but he was healing. So they called us way across the United States because we have a very different approach to training. We never withhold food. We train by reading to them. These are birds that are not used to being close to people. And so we check out library books and read to them and talk to them. Uh, they're free lofted in their aviary. They can be anywhere they, are wa they want to be. Skye arrived, and he chose to be as far away from me as he possibly could be. He chose a shelf that was about eye height, stumps going up to it, handicapped ramps. He was able to work his way safely up, and he turned his back on me. If you've ever been confronted by an angry eagle, you, you would know it. it, it you know, they, they bend down, and they, he was just really angry. So I would feed him. I didn't want him to worry about food. Falconry is a whole different thing because those are birds that are flighted. Our birds usually can't fly anymore. So I didn't want to withhold food and have a bird be anxious about that. They're fed early in the morning, whether they learn something or not that day. And they can be up high. High would be up high height. So began by reading to him and talking to him and singing to him. And um, that's a very peculiar thing because he started singing back. He, he, he sounds a little like a foghorn. Um, but it's, you know, it is melodic to me. And he turned around. So I knew that we had to put anklets on him. We had to trim his nails. We had to have him stand this close to a person. He had to learn to trust. He also had to learn to get over that anger. If you think about the last time you were really mad, really angry. Sky could have stayed that way. I it's exhausting. But he could have. He wouldn't be doing this. Because he moved from being very angry to accepting his life, even though it's not the one that he thought it was going to be. So he made the decision. We'll talk about how he moved from anger and how the training continued. This guy doesn't come out like Noah needs to come out, but he does, um, he sometimes has to turn around in the box, so he's uh, a little loud coming out. You got yourself there, son. Um, I'm going to turn in this way just so he... I know you're going to sing to this group. That would be lovely. Uh, Sky sings rarely, but he does sing. Um, when we... <laughs> let Sue clean this mess up. Um, no, no, it would be best to... Oh, I know. Would you like to sing? We'll, um, we'll talk about singing because... He's, uh, he really is magnificent when he is in the mood to see. So you must be a very special group. We'll, we'll uh, see if he'll sing. Sky, 
he's my friend and he'll stay my friend doesn't matter what other people say to me because he's my friend to the bitter end even though the bitter ends a million years away i was singing, oh nice i was singing i was singing um that song from the unsinkable molly brown uh, during a um, garden club and a lady burst into tears and I said Skye's pretty magnificent isn't he and she said no it's your singing if you can get the eagle feather right up front here we started by moving a little bit closer to him to get him used to being on a glove we didn't want to touch him with something that might be frightening to him, a hand, so we touched him with a feather, his own. Touched his chest, touched his only wing. That took literally months. He didn't want anybody close to his only wing. When he let us touch his feet, we knew we had his trust because a golden eagle, thank you, Sue, a golden eagle can crush the skull of a coyote. They can bring down a 100-pound brown bear. Um, they are the king of all birds for a reason. Power, strength, courage. They have 2,000 pounds per square inch of grip. And so the glove is lined with Kevlar. Yeah, it's a nice group, huh? I took him to, um, he did step up, I took him to a uh, cancer survivor group. It very dear to me because I'm a cancer survivor. And a lady came up after the program and said, I have been on chemo and I gave it up because I'm done. And then I heard Skye's story and I decided if he can go through the medical treatments, so can I. So he has really touched the hearts and minds of thousands of people. Life got better for Skye because he shares his aviary with Chrysos. That means gold in Greek. She is a golden eagle from South Dakota. She is She's from Utah, uh, Salt Lake City, and she is a head taller than he is. Most birds of prey, the female is bigger than the male. So she is just huge. And he adores her. I did a program for Harley Davidson and they gave us a squeaker dog toy. It was a pink hog. And he loves this thing, but he presents it to her wherever she is in the aviary. I'm not sure she's fond of the hog, but <laughs> he thinks it's a great gift. So. Wonderful bird, throughout, um, found throughout the world, the bird of Zeus, the bird of the Roman Empire, on the flag of Mexico, on coins and emblems. Um, in the Bible, if you read the Bible, any reference to the eagle, it's the golden. So they are uh, absolutely amazing. Questions about, yes? Um, 12 to 13 pounds in this country. In Siberia, there's a story of At Atalanta, who was a falconry bird, and she weighed 29 pounds. Absolutely huge. Yes? Well, Bird of Zeus, too, if you study. It is. Questions? Other questions? Yes? For Sky, it took two and a half years. Yeah. But we can we can take him anywhere. Mm -hmm. I took him to Special Olympics and little girls and took him to the and said he was quite big. Any other questions? Yes. I've, I've seen the uh, uh, bald eagles real high in the sky, walk together, yes, and then drop back to earth. Is that mating? That's mating and fun. Mating and fun. Yeah. Sometimes the uh, youngsters do it. Sometimes. Do do it? No, no, they they don't. Yeah. Um, I've read that the golden can dive at 200 miles an hour. Um, yeah, the peregrine can do 254 maximum speed. Yeah, amazing. It's incredible, incredible. Well, they have babies. Um, they Fortunately, she's not interested in incubating eggs, and it's a good thing because it would take them both out of education. Uh, and we can't duplicate the wild. What they would see is a person bringing food every day. And that's not the right message. Stay with me. He's ready to go back to her. Stay with me. 
He's shirking his responsibilities at night. Yes. Um, the the record is um, 45 years in captivity. Yes. They're, they see worse than we do at night, but better, uh, eight times better than we do in the daylight. Yes. They grab it on the back of the neck and sever the spinal cord. Mm. Pleasant discussion, isn't it? Yes. I think that they respond more to um, if, if when I train handlers, it's the, if you're nervous and, and uh, upset, they pick it up, just like a horse or a dog. So being as calm as possible assures them. I think birds understand more than we think they do. I think they're just amazing. What I'm going to do is finish with a story. If you'd like to take the stick, and he's ready to take off. And if you take this for a moment, and I'm just going to put him back. Would you like to salute them? They were wonderful. Would you salute them? You should salute this dog. Oh. oh. He really is comfortable here. Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to conclude with uh, one story about Alaskan bald eagles. Um, when I was there, I met Dr. Jim Scott, veterinarian in the Anchorage area, taking care of bald eagles in Alaska. And he had just had a female bald eagle in rehabilitation that he told me about. Uh, it, w it was a beautiful, big adult bald eagle raising babies with the father eagle. They were now out of the nest, and the parents were teaching the babies how to catch fish. National Geographic makes it look so wonderfully easy. Fly over water, grasp a fish, and off you go. But it's so hard to learn that. And somewhere in the process of teaching her youngsters, she became injured. She was found by a person that cared a great deal, brought her to the uh, bird treatment and learning center in Anchorage and Dr. Scott was the veterinarian. He did full x-rays. He found fortunately the wing was not fractured but it was probably sprained. Muscles, tendons hurt. So he needed to keep her in rehab for a while knowing that the father was still involved and the father would take care of the babies. Over time she began to trust him and talk to him. She would see him coming through the door and she would whisper to him. She would say, ah, 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 just to him, nobody else. He put her through different treatments, cold laser treatments, wanted to keep that flexibility in the healthy wing, moved into physical therapy, and he would, this eagle would see Dr. Scott down the hall and say, ah, 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 ah just to him. After about 30 days, he really wanted her to get back into the wild, and the wing was showing great signs of healing. So he got a big carrier, the kind Great Danes come in. He carefully put this big, beautiful bald eagle into the box and drove the many miles to the outskirts of Anchorage until he saw the nest. And so he put the box down on the ground always a difficult time when you're going to release a bird because you want to make sure that it can lift off, that it's not going to become injured on the way. And so he opened the door of the carrier and the eagle stepped out onto the earth, opened up about six and a half feet of wings, saw her nest, and she took off right for it, landed safely on it, and then she leaped from the nest, flew right over Dr. Scott's head, and said, ah, 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 ah. and then she flew away. Thank you for coming tonight. You are a joy. And thank you, Sue.